Emerson, Evans, Fuller, Gaines, Hancock, Harmon, Hernandez, Huff, Kehoe, Lamalfa, Leno, Ted Lou, Carol Lou, Lowenthal, Negrete McLeod, Padilla, Pavley, Price, Rubio, Runner, Smidian, Steinberg, Strickland, Vargas, Walters, Wolk, Wright, Wyland, Yee. The absence of a quorum having been duly noted, the Sergeant at Arms is asked to please lock the doors and call the absent members. Will the Sergeant at Arms please call the absent members? Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Alquist, Anderson, Berryhill, Blakesley, Calderon, Canella, Corbett, Correa, De Leon, Desaigne, Dutton, Emerson, Evans, Fuller, Gaines, Hancock, Harmon, Hernandez, Huff, Kehoe. Lamalfa, Leno, Ted Lou, Carol Lou, Lowenthal, Negrete McLeod, Padilla, Pavley, Price, Rubio, 
Runner, Semidian, Steinberg, Strickland, Vargas, Walters, Wolk, Wright, Wyland, Yee. Members, a quorum has been established. Could we ask that the members and our guests beyond the rail and in the gallery please rise? We will be led in prayer this morning by our chaplain, Rabbi Mona Alfi, after which please remain standing. We will be led in the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag by State Senator Alex Padilla. Rabbi? Good morning. Good morning. I believe that the Holy One delights in diversity. By looking at the world around us, we can see the beauty of God's varied creations in nature and in humanity. And we experience the blessings of diversity in our country every day. The noted 20th century attorney and author Louis Neiser observed that many people with different backgrounds, cultures, languages, and creeds combine to make a nation. But he said that nation is greater than the sum total of the individual skills and talents of its people. That intangible quantity is often due to the differences which make the texture of the nation rich. Therefore, we must never wipe out or deride the differences amongst us. For where there is no difference, there is only indifference. We pray to the Holy One, the creator of us all, to grant us the ability to appreciate and learn from our differences. May the blessings that we each bring strengthen our nation, enrich our communities, and inspire us as we go about our daily tasks. May this be God's will. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Members, we begin with privileges of the floor. Do we have any members who wish to present under privileges of the floor? If not, we will pass temporarily. We'll move on to messages from the governor, which will be deemed read. Messages from the assembly, which will be deemed read. Reports of committees <clears throat> will be deemed read and amendments adopted without objection. Members, that takes us to motions and resolutions. Under motions and resolutions, without objection, the following resolution will be withdrawn from committee and placed on today's special consent calendar, that is AJR Assembly Joint Resolution 31. Without objection. Gaines. Senator Gaines, for what purpose? Do you rise to object, sir? No. no. Without objection, so ordered. Senator Gaines, for what purpose do you rise? Yes, I request uh, unanimous consent to take up SCR 70 without reference to file. Members, we have a request from Senator Gaines to take up this item without reference to file. Is there any objection? Seeing and hearing none, Mr. Secretary, please read. Senate Concurrent Resolution 70 by Senator Gaines relative to the National Day of the Cowboy. Senator Great, Gaines, thank you, Mr. Proceed. President and members. I bring to you today SCR 70, California's National Day of the Cowboy. SCR 70 recognizes the cowboys and cowgirls of every generation who contribute to the heritage of California, use the land, who ranch, who provide agricultural products that feed this country. The spirit of the cowboy reminds us of the hard work, perseverance, patriotism, and integrity that helped to build California and that continue to strengthen us. SCR 70 also commends organizations such as Future Farmers of America, 4-H, and other educational endeavors that prepare young people to carry on the ongoing cowboy and cowgirl lifestyle. SB 70 will recognize Senator the Gaines, one moment, please. One moment, Senator Gaines. Please proceed. Great, thank you. SB 70 will recognize the fourth Saturday of July in perpetuity as California's National Day of the Cowboy. I ask for your vote. Debate or discussion? Senator LaMalfa. Senator LaMalfa. Good morning. Also, I want to rise in support of Senator Gaines' resolution here. Now, that's one you can get behind for me. So um, it's, it's uh, certainly reflective of our rural Northern California, but also of how the West was won. And uh, I think this is a, a great uh, proclamation effort by Senator Gaines. And again, one we can all get excited about. Yeehaw. Thank you. Please vote. 
Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Senator Gaines, would, do you wish to close? I just ask for your aye vote. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Alquist? Aye. aye. Anderson? Aye. Berryhill? Aye. Blakesley? Aye. Calderon? Aye. aye. Canella? Aye. aye. Corbett? Correa? Aye. aye. De Leon? Aye. Desaigne? Aye. aye. Dutton? Aye. Emerson? Aye. Evans? Fuller? Aye. Gaines? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Harmon? Aye. Hernandez? Huff? Aye. Kehoe? Aye. Lamalfa? Aye. Leno? Aye. Ted Lou? Aye. Carol Lou? Aye. Lowenthal? Aye. Negretta McLeod? Aye. Padilla? Aye. Pavley? Aye. Price? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Runner? Semidian? Aye. Steinberg? Aye. Strickland? Vargas? Aye. Walters? Wolk? Aye. Wright? Wyland? Ye. Ye aye. Call the absent members. Corbett? Evans? Hernandez? Runner? Strickland? Walters? Wright? Wyland? Ayes 32, noes 0. The resolution is adopted. Members, that takes us to governor's appointments on the daily file. Senator Steinberg, would you like to pass temporarily on these items, or do you have items you wish to take up? Members, we will pass temporarily on the governor's appointments. We will move to Senate third reading. On Senate third reading, our first file item today is file item 16, Senator LaMalfa's SR 27. Senator LaMalfa will present at Senator Steinberg's desk. Senator LaMalfa, one moment, please. We'll ask the secretary to please read. And uh, Senator LaMalfa, I understand we're going to uh, integrate both your introductions on the floor as well as your presentation of SR 27. Mr. Secretary, please read. Senate Resolution 27 by Senator LaMalfa relative to National Surveyors Week. Good morning. I'm presenting on behalf of the National Surveyors Week proclamation. Uh, this is a, a proclamation that uh, take into, takes into account the, the good work and engineering that goes on from the National Surveyors of all over California in this country. We have, in California alone, 3,400 professional surveyors in our state. And uh, including, going back into our nation's history, some of the first surveyors were George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. Of course, they've advanced many technical uh, technologies that have come forward to help make our roads, our bridges, everything that's engineered, everything that's surveyed, that much more accurate and better. Including on my own farm, where we have uh, our own fields were leveled by some of their help and including my dad back in the day when, after college, he was in a, a surveying role for USDA and Department of Interior. So their, their contributions to society are, are, are great for our infrastructure. We have uh, two gentlemen here today, one from the CSLA, the uh, California State Land Sur Surveyors Association, and the American Council for Engineering Companies. So please uh, welcome today with us Frank Lehman from the California Land Surveyors and Justin Height from American Council of Engineering Companies. Uh, Senator LaMalfa, we join you in welcoming your guests. Senator LaMalfa, just to make their smiles a little bigger, may I suggest that we ask for a voice vote at this time if there's no objection? Any objection to a voice vote on SR 27? Seeing and hearing none, members, all those in favor of SR 27, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Members, the ayes have it. Resolution is adopted. Did you 
Members, that takes us to file item 17. File item 17. This is SB 1004 from the Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review. We will call on Senator Leno after we ask the Secretary to please read. Senate Bill 1004 by the Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2012. Senator Leno, one moment while we ask the House to come to order. Senator Leno, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, this bill and the succeeding 39 bills will be sent over to the Assembly for purposes of being budget trailer bills. Assembly will be sending like number over to us, final product, of course, being our budget for the 2012-2013 fiscal year. This is a practice which this legislature has utilized for the past decade with full bipartisan cooperation. We, of course, have had now four full budget committee hearings representing over 20 hours of public participation. Subcommittees are meeting every week throughout this month, going through the bud budget as proposed by the governor, line item by line item. So there is full transparency, full public participation, and I would ask for your aye vote. Senator Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Pro Tem. Um, Members, uh, I rise in opposition uh, to this measure. I, I'm not sure we're following the rules. Let me re remind you what the rules are. Joint Rule 29.5 states that a committee uh, on conference of the budget may consider only differences between the assembly version of the budget bill as passed by the assembly and the Senate version of the budget bill as passed by the Senate. Stated in plain English, this means the Senate should develop and pass a complete state budget to the State Assembly, and the Assembly should do the same for us. You can't resolve the differences between the two legislative houses if all we pass are empty spot bills. Given the recent passage of Prop 25, the Majority Vote Budget Authority, and the outcome of last year's budget, the majority party in each legislative house is clearly capable of passing a state budget plan in order to properly establish a budget conference committee. Senator Emerson, one moment, please. Given the importance of the item before the body, I'm going to ask that the members please take their seats and try and take conversations, if any, to the rear of the chambers. One moment, please, Senator Emerson. Members, could we ask for your full attention, please? Well, we know how they're going one to moment, please. Senators, one moment, please. Senator Emerson, please proceed. Yeah, like many Californians, I hope these empty shell bills don't ex represent the majority party's vision for what is an honest and balanced state budget. All of California is watching. The Senate needs to present its full and complete vision for a state budget and stop the games. I ask for a no vote on these blank pieces of legislation. Further debate or discussion? Senator Dutton. Uh, Mr. President and members, uh, I uh, rise to actually agree with uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Emerson, in, in uh, opposing uh, this measure. Last week, under condition of the file, I reminded the body that approximately 15 plus years ago, the Senate and the Assembly would actually pass their own budget and independently and then reconcile their differences in a budget conference committee. In the late 1990s, though, that practice, uh, we started moving to this current practice of, of moving empty bills. Now, the reason they did that is because the two-thirds vote requirement was considered to be cumbersome and, and so forth, that so they felt like this was the most expedient way to, to move the process. Uh, the problem with that now is, is that you no longer have a two-thirds vote requirement on the budget. Uh, we actually have a simple majority vote requirement. And so now there's no reason to continue this practice from before that was basically put into effect because of that requirement. Today what we're doing, we're sending 40 bills to the assembly that really say nothing. Uh, they're empty. Months from now those bills are gonna come back. They'll emerge as a take it or take it or nothing type proposition, take it or all, and leave it alone because you can't amend them once they come back. Uh, 
Uh, there's no more type of negotiation. As a matter of fact, the other problem that happens, a lot of times we don't even know what's going to be in those bills about an hour before uh, they're actually acted on. I think it's about time that you need to really show the people of California what the budget is. I would urge a no vote on these empty bills. Is there further debate or discussion? Further debate or discussion? Senator LaMalfa? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you know, in the past, it's always seemed like there's been kind of a gentleman or gentle ladies agreement in moving these bills across with some uh, good faith that there's going to be a debate on them as they come back. But again, we see that they're done in the dark of night. And, you know, we just, we just passed a resolution a while ago on, you know, on the cowboy. And that things could be done in that way with a, with a handshake or with your good word. And unfortunately, we've lost that in this legislature. And this doesn't help perpetuate good feelings within the legislature or by the public that watches us. We have, uh, again, 40 bills are going to come over there. They're blank. And we're going to get them back with very short notice sometime later in the year when the budget is about due. And not the input from the public. So what we have coming up, ironically enough, is Sunshine Week that we celebrate around here. Sunshine Week. Now that's not us trying to steal Florida's state motto or trying to uh, think that this legislature finally does have control over the weather by making a piece of legislation. No, that's the measure that would be about the public's right to know what its government is doing and why. And the Senate, of course, encourages all Californians to participate in activities relating to open government and to access its public information. So how can we have a proclamation about Sunshine Week and on the other hand, be doing a process on something so important and so involved for all Californians, on their schools, on their highways, on health care, all the things that people care about are what we do, and then push them through at the last minute with 40 blank pieces of paper. So if we really want to gain the faith of the people of California and have an open process of us working together, you know, having those battles in committee, have them in conference committee, as Senator Dutton said, instead of just a last minute deal with 40 blank pieces of paper. Therefore, I must ask for a no vote on this measure. Further debate or discussion? Senator Harmon. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise in strong opposition to this uh, process, which is being uh, ramrodded, for lack of a better phrase, uh, by the majority party to send spot bills. Now, for those of you that might be watching on television or in the gallery, a spot bill is empty. There's nothing in it. We're sending the Senate budget proposal to the other house empty. No proposal at all. And here's, here's a good example of what happens when you uh, approve spot bills. Uh, I'm holding in my hand uh, a 21-page bill from last year's budget exercise. This was uh, uh, AB 118. Uh, it uh, was drafted by the Ledge Council uh, and delivered to the floor, according to the timestamp on the uh, bill, at 5.40 p.m. on June 28th of last year. 5.40, Ledge Council finished drafting the bill. Well, guess when we voted on it? 7.01 p.m. the same day. That's an hour and 21 minutes later to look at a budget bill that's 21 pages long. Senator Harmon, one moment, please. Sure. Members, could we have order in the Senate, please? You know, Mr. Member, President, I think it'd be nice if every senator was uh, shown the courtesy to the people speaking to take their seats. I see about eight or ten people standing away from their seats, with the exception of the uh, author of the, uh, of the matter before us. I wish you would ask that. I know you did earlier in the morning, and it looks like people ignored that request. Well, I think I, it's appropriate to have senators be seated. We have substantial compliance, and I'm going to ask once again that if members could take their desks, uh, unless it's absolutely necessary to be up and about, that will help ensure an orderly and uh, brisk debate. Thank you, members. Please proceed, Senator Hart. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you for the courtesy of members taking their seats uh, while they listen to the comments about these spot bills that we're sending over to the Assembly. 
I was saying that this spot bill from last year was drafted by ledge council and then acted on by this house an hour and 21 minutes later. Do you think the public had an opportunity to read this bill? I'll tell you they didn't. You think members did? You think staff did? You think hardly anybody did? So that's the problem with stock spot bills. They go over to the other house, come back in the middle of the night with little time to look at them, to analyze them, to let stakeholders look at it. It's shameful for us to uh, engage in this kind of practice. So that's that's one thing that I want to talk about. Another thing I want to talk about is uh, this is a copy of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know, what California is doing is even caught the attention of people in New York City. Take a look at this. This is the uh, March 8th edition of the Wall Street Journal where they talk about our budget process and the governor's uh, proposal. And uh, what caught the attention of the Wall Street Journal uh, dealt with uh, the Facebook uh, uh, IPO, an initial public offering, uh, may generate uh, as much as $2.5 billion in unexpected revenue uh, for the state of California over the next couple of years. And the, the journal points out in an op-ed that was published in the paper on that date uh, that this isn't the first time California's had a little unexpected bonanza of cash, if you will. We did that when the Google uh, IPO uh, was issued and uh, those taxpayers that sold that stock uh, made millions and millions if not billions of dollars and they paid substantial income taxes on it. Here's the problem. We are going down a trail of taxing the ultra rich in this state and their income goes up and their income goes down and that's why our budget deficits, in my opinion, go up and go down because we're so dependent on the taxes that are paid by people who are making over $500,000 a year. State Franchise Tax Board, according to this article in the Wall Street Journal, recently reported that Californians earning $500,000 a year or more fell to 98000 in 2009. That was the last time they had records of it, from 146,000. So 146,000 people were over 500,000, then it dropped down to 98,000. That was in 2009, and I can guarantee you it's gone down below that. So this group of taxpayers in the $500,000 income or higher is shrinking. And one of the reasons it's shrinking is people that are in those high income brackets are leaving the state. Why would you stay in this state when we're probably the highest taxing state of people in that category? So I, I would submit to you that we need to address the long term problems of why we have these continuing deficit budgets. And one of them is because of our tax policy, and perhaps the major one is because of our spending policies. As soon as we get a little extra money or can borrow it or beg it or whatever, uh, it's spent on programs that uh, have not had oversight that don't make any sense. I'd like to see those types of budget items discussed here on this floor with a budget proposal from the majority party, but instead we're getting empty spot bills that contain nothing that are going to be sent across the building to the assembly uh, and will come back to us in the middle of the night uh, just as this bill that I referred to earlier, AB 118, did a trailer bill from last year. I urge a no vote. This is the wrong way to deal with our financial disaster that's been created by this legislature here in California. I urge a no vote. Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. President. A couple of years ago, I had a bill that I introduced that would require a minimum of 72 hours for this body to be able to review it in print before making a decision. Now, we do all kinds of transparency laws and disclosure for local government that somehow we can't apply to ourselves here in the state capitol. Well, the bill typically, as others like it, um, met its fate somewhere in rules. There's evidently a little black hole of the universe there where things just sort of disappear and die quietly. 
But nevertheless, we all have, well, maybe not all of us have experienced that. We on this side of the aisle have experienced that. But how this plays out, uh, let me give an example of that. Um, last year, according to the timestamp, AB 114 um, finished Ledge Council at 8.35 p.m. Passed out of the Senate less than two hours later, 10.33 p.m., June 28th. You remember it. It was called Education-Related Statutory Revisions in the Majority Floor Analysis. Here's what the LA Times said about it. Ham-fisted yet pandering and fiscally irresponsible too, AB 114 perpetrates an abuse of state power that could wreak budgetary havoc in local school districts. But in that case, why hasn't the news been filled with details of this bad government bill as it wended its way through the legislature? Because it was hurriedly and secretively passed quite literally in the dark of night with no committee hearings and almost no public notice, and then quickly signed by Governor Jerry Brown. Just this Sunday, a member of this body had an editorial in a local paper that op-ed that criticized a part of the 2009 budget deal uh, that dealt with a corporate tax policy item because, quote, that vote was done at 2.30 a.m. in the morning. The measure was not in print, nor did it ever have a single committee hearing. And that's the problem. Both of these examples move through this body just like these are as spot bills. Now we've changed the rules of engagement, the voters have. They've said that the legislature can now do majority vote budgets. We had our first one last year, business as usual. So as we move spot bills through, understand that we and the Republican side will have two votes on this. Today, where we say, no, we won't move the spot bill. And then when it comes back to us with language you've never seen, and we will be saying, no, we don't like this either. I urge a no vote on these spot bills. For the debate or discussion, Senator Steinberg. Senator Steinberg. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. Um, I think a little uh, calm is in order here. You know, my colleagues' comments remind me of uh, Claude Rains in Casablanca. I'm shocked, I'm shocked there's gambling in these parts. Please. Uh, this process, as Senator Leno said, has been identical since 2004. Which, by the way, uh, coincidentally was the last year, as Senator Leno pointed out, we got more Republican votes to move budget bills before the budget plan was completed. Under Senator Leno's leadership, there could not be more transparency in this budget process. 42 budget subcommittee hearings scheduled before the May revise? Kidding me? Four full budget committee hearings? Full participation of all members and the public? You know, we do have an obligation, members, to get a budget done by June the 15th. And, and moving these so-called spot bills, which when they are filled with content will have full rigorous public hearings and participation is a way for us to meet our constitutional obligation to get a budget passed by June the 15th. I will say this always with respect, but I wish, I say this to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I wish your commitment to participating in matching expenditures and revenues, the budget itself, matched your passion here on the question of, of doing what we have to do to ensure that we get a budget done on time. Let's get on with the business here. Urgent. Further debate or discussion, Senator Blakesley. Thank you, Mr. President Pro Tem. Uh, members, it's not often that the minority party stands up in the way they have today to seek to address uh, the matters that are before us. And we do it not lightly, but we bring these matters to your attention because we feel we have a duty in our role as the loyal opposition to identify when the body has lost its way. The budget chair rightly said that this has been the practice of this House and that 
Historically, it has occurred with, as I quote, the full bipartisan participation of the body. After today's vote, that statement cannot be said again. Next year, it will not be accurate. What has changed? Why are we no longer content to move forward a spot bill? Quite simply, Prop 25 changed everything. Prop 25 changed the rules of the game, of course, in a way that now requires there be little or no bipartisan agreement, but that's only a small piece of the issues that we're seeking to bring to the attention of the body today. Perhaps an even more weighty matter is the fact that increasingly important policy decisions, ones which should go through the committee process, through the policy committee process, are finding their way into budget bills, which takes away the power of every member of the majority party who chairs a committee who believes they should be able to bring this matter before their colleagues. Secondly, in the aftermath of Prop 20, and that's being done simply by adding a thousand dollar appropriation. Secondly, we all saw writ large last year an effort to take away the right of the people of recall, referendum, and initiative when a failure to achieve a two-thirds vote on a bill that dealt with out-of-state taxation rules with Amazon and in the face of a potential referendum going to the people, a concerted effort was made to then take another such majority vote bill, slap an appropriation onto it, and by virtue of it moving through in a way that would then make the matter non-referendable would take away that right from the people. Another abuse of the process. A third that I'd like to identify is that the Constitution explicitly says that under Article 4, Section 8D, that matters like this that are passed as an urgency that go into effect immediately cannot be used to create or abolish any office. And on February 2nd, this body did exactly that under SB 98 when it restored the Board of Registered Nursing. Again, not that we're opposed to restoring the Board of Registered Nursing. It's a matter of process. It's a matter not only of the rights of the minority being respected, but of the majority and not ceding power to the very few. And this abuse of Prop 25 includes all these very important process and policy issues, but the one thing the people of California wanted to be sure was included in conferring majority right to this body to pass budgets without compromise with the minority party was to ensure that salaries would be cut off if an honest budget was not passed on time. And what has happened since then? The leadership of both houses have decided to sue the controller so the only accountability element in Prop 25 would be stripped away. It is an abuse of power. And it is right and proper that the minority party who are friends and colleagues with you address it. We respect Prop 25. We know that you can pass these budgets over our objections. But we do believe in sunshine. We do believe the process should be honored. And we do believe in the deeply corrosive effect this body is now traveling down. I therefore ask for a no vote on these spot bills. Senator Hancock. Thank you so much, Mr. President. As we exchange rhetoric, I just want to point out one thing. The full budget committee of this Senate has held, I believe, three, four, Committees of the whole, hearings that went on all day, discussing the governor's proposed budget, challenging, exchanging ideas. I was so disappointed, having been to all of those meetings, that the minority party barely attended. There were some where there'd be one or two members. I would ask you, one of the hopes of Prop 25 was that it would reach out to members of the minority party and say you can't hold the state of California hostage anymore, uh, but come, engage in a dialogue. Uh, if you want things to be in the budget or changes, come talk with us. 
So I would ask, please, uh, come to these meetings. The subcommittee meetings have been better. Uh, Mr. Anderson, Senator Anderson, who serves on my budget sub, has been, um, has been terrific about attending. But the committee meetings of the whole, where we looked at the big issues, we did not have full participation. So to complain now seems a little, um, just a little disingenuous. And I would urge all of us to sit down, talk with each other, and tell us your ideas and the changes that you would like to see. We're all trying to get the very best budget we can from the people of California. I would ask for an I vote. Senator Anderson. I, uh, I just have a quick point. I, I want to commend the 42 meetings, uh, hearings, the four big hearings with everybody included. I just have a rhetorical question. That is, we've had all these hearings. Why don't we have language in those spot bills? We've had the hearings. We've done the vetting. Let's fill them out. Let's, let's, let's send them over there with information in them. Uh, that's my only point. Thank you. Senator Fuller. The budget practice that was instituted in 2004, it worked at that time. At that time, we had a different set of circumstances. But that was not a long period in our 100 plus year history. So I don't think it's set in stone, and I don't think that any of us sitting here would be responsible legislators if we said, wow, that's forever now and it works forever, because frankly, it is not going to work for us as well. While this debate takes a little longer and it's uncomfortable, we are participating, and we are participating because our message is today that we are getting uncomfortable. And there are a number factor, of factors of why we are getting uncomfortable, and I'm going to list some of those today in an effort, as the teacher that I am, to clarify what it is that we need to get out on the table and talk about before it gets worse. Number one. In the 2004 years and later, there was a big five of our leadership that sat down together and sketched out what the budget conceptually was going to look like, and they began filtering it back and forth with their caucuses. After a time, it's true, that quit working and we didn't do it anymore. But that's part of the point that without that, we wouldn't have been able to do the other process. And that left a vacuum for information to trickle down and an earlier start time that used to happen. Then there was the two-thirds vote. It allowed a portion of the minority, not, not body, not everyone, but a portion, to include their major concerns because it just couldn't get out. Obviously, that quit working. It got changed. It's not there. So that that safeguard is gone. Then trailer bills in those days were actually accounting bills, accounting vehicles, rather than policy statements and policy uh, issues. And once they became policy issues, one of the things that happened is yes, the registered nurses board might not seem like a big deal to everybody, but it put us on notice that something was beginning to change in the way we do business and something was not getting to us in, until it was a whole bundled up or down vote and it was too late. On time budget means that we need to start openly now. It means that all these issues need to be laid out. Now, as to the point about the committees, yes, there are a lot of hearings. And yes, we are in two or three committees at a time. And yes, I watch some of it from my TV come and go, and I read some of it, and I bet everybody here who has more than one committee does that. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, you can't do it if there's no figures or no language in the bill. I sat through the Governance and Finance Committee, which I think is a fine committee, and I think we worked very, very hard all last year. But I did not get figures 
I could not get language. A lot of the stuff passed out, and, and it's not the chair's fault. That was a, the chair did a great job. But to this day, my counties are still struggling to figure out what it was, and when they asked me why I didn't know, I don't have an answer. Except that, well, I was a good sport, and I didn't get up, and I didn't identify what it is that's troubling me. So today, and you know, I've, this is not my favorite thing to get up, but today I'm just saying that I'm asking for a no vote on continuing in a process that has changed. And let's look for a way to have the numbers with concrete language out there, because guess what? We always revise it 10 times anyway. Let's do it now. And this is the first step. Let's take control of it, make the process. At the end of the day, we all disagree, fine. At least we're informed. But let's not be uninformed and calling each other names because we disagree and don't even understand on what issues. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Senator. Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we've heard last week, we've heard today that all the hearings that are taking place, um, one of my colleagues rightfully stated why that's different now than in the past, because at least somewhere Republicans had an input in it. But just because we have a lot of motion, let's not equate that to action. And just because we have action by holding hearings, let's not equate that to results or doing anything. Where are the votes? Where are the decisions that have resulted? Because that's what we're dialoguing about. We're dialoguing about the fact that as Republicans, we have been frozen out of the process. There is no big five. There's no, that was the last vestige of Republicans having any input, any input. So you ask us to go and sit in hearings where we can hear what we know already. We're spending too much money. We need to cut our level of government to make it lean and efficient. We need to grow jobs. Those are the answers to this. And yet you're going to put your solution out. The next time we see this, it will be a sham budget put together in the dark of night, passed without any Republican input. It doesn't matter how many hearings you hold, you're accomplishing nothing. And it goes back to the quote, sound and fury signifying nothing. Let's have a real budget with real discussion, real votes. Further debate or discussion, Senator Gaines. I'd like to get back to our uh, history in the state of California in terms of our budget. Nine out of the last 10 budgets have not been balanced in the state of California. We've got a problem. When, when I was first elected to the assembly, the first bill I proposed was really reintroduction of the GAN limit, which admittedly was watered down on a bipartisan basis over time. But clearly, we, we should get back to basics, and that is having a balanced budget. And it seems to me that even with the governor's initiative uh, to go to the people and ask for a tax increase, shouldn't we be doing the, the responsible thing and making sure that any budget that comes out of this body or out of the assembly is truly balanced before we know what sort of revenue may or may not flow in as a result of the vote of the people. And so it speaks to looking at spot bills with absolutely no language. It gives us no clarity in terms of whether we're truly going to have a balanced budget or not. So I'd urge a no vote until we have clarity in the language in these bills that we're truly going to have a balanced budget and do the right thing and on a bipartisan basis uh, for our constituents when our constituents have to do this on a daily basis. Small business owners have to balance their budget. Households have to balance their budget. And we ought to expect the same thing from ourselves. So I urge a no vote. Thank you. Is there additional debate or discussion? Any additional debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Senator Leno, you may close. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. I'm just going to ask everyone to take a deep breath and to exhale. It's been a very wide-ranging conversation. I wouldn't know where to begin, and my response would take at least a half hour, which would interest no one, including myself. So I'll keep it short. But 
It's, it's, it's fascinating. You know, I would agree with Senator Blakesley that what has changed from today and the previous nine, 10 years where we have followed this practice is Prop 25. And what voters did in the passage of Prop 25 was to restore democracy to the budget process here in Sacramento. Democracy, as I use the word, defined by majority rule, simple majority rule. That is the foundation stone of our democracy. It's how we kind of elect our president. That's certainly how we elect all of us. Democracy, simple majority rule. Uh, we're one of the only states that has these two-thirds vote requirements, which is not democracy. Clearly, the minority party has veto power. Uh, and with regard to the pass of the budget, the minority party no longer has that veto power. And I think we can recognize that. So that is a significant change. And that's probably why we are having this conversation, because the question is, of what role and what participation is the minority party when the majority can rule, when there is democracy? I'm not here to tell you I have those answers, but I think that's really at the crux of this whole debate. Taken with some of the comments with regard to transparency and process and public participation, I can't overlook the irony in that nearly, and I know there are some exceptions, every one of my Republican colleagues have signed a pledge abrogating their legislative responsibility to a fellow multimillionaire uh, K Street lobbyist in Washington, D.C. named Grover Norquist, never elected to any office, but having really limited the process and the debate on our entire budget. When I talk to middle school students about the budget process, even as complex as California's, I tell them it's really third grade arithmetic. It's addition and subtraction. And Grover Norquist has required that all addition be taken off the table we can't even talk about it. It's a foregone conclusion. We have a good number of us already pledged there will be no discussion of addition. So now we're just left with subtraction. So we're already hamstrung before we begin the process. No shortcuts are being taken today. In fact, there's more transparency in this budget year and this budget process than ever before. And if my colleagues are interested in participating, honestly participating in this debate, I would encourage you to follow Senator Anderson's lead and show up at the subcommittee hearings. When only one party shows up at the subcommittee hearings, we're not having a full debate. So first and foremost, show up. I think that's the strongest statement of a real sincere desire to participate and to have transparency and to have process. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, we'll have further debates. Quite honestly, this is the leanest budget that has been proposed since 1972 when Governor Ronald Reagan was governor. We have lost $13 billion of tax revenue annually. We are short $13 billion relative to our budget of 1995 because of tax breaks, tax cuts that have not been restored. And because of the two-thirds threshold and the Grover Norquist pledge being signed, we now have to proceed to the ballot this November so that voters can decide whether they want to see their colleges and their universities and their K through 12 classrooms and their court system and all the other, and their park systems and all the other benefits of public institutions further cut because we can't talk about revenue here in this legislature. So I would ask for your I vote. Members, I'm about to call the roll Subsequent to calling the roll and announcing the results, I would ask for the attention of members with respect to various parliamentary matters that will be before the body. Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Alquist? Aye. Aye. Anderson? No. no. Berryhill? Blakesley? No. Calderon? Aye. Aye. Canella? No. Corbett? Correa? Aye. Aye. De Leon? Aye. Aye. Desaigne? Aye. Aye. Dutton? Aye. No. Emerson? No. Evans? I Fuller, no Gaines, no Hancock, I Harmon, no Hernandez, Huff, no Kehoe, I Lamalfa, no Leno, I Ted Lou, I Carol Lou, I Lowenthal, I Negretta McLeod, I Padilla, 
I Pavley, I Price, I Rubio, I Runner, Semidian, I Steinberg, I Strickland, Vargas, I Walters, Wolk, I Wright, I Wyland, Ye, Ye I. Eyes 23, nose 10, the bill is passed. Members, I anticipate that in a moment, Senator Leno will be asking for unanimous consent to apply the previous roll call to Senate Bills 1005 through 1043. Those are file items 18 to 56. The alternative, of course, would be to take each one of those items up individually and to have a floor debate as we've just had here on the floor, bill by bill. Before we recognize Senator Leno for that purpose, uh, the presiding officer would like to remind members of the rules of the House as contained in Mason's manual, and this reflects a concern in presiding about comments on both sides of the aisle from all members in the push and shove of the debate. Mason specifically provides that no person may indulge in personalities or impugn the motives of members. Further provides that in a debate, a member must confine remarks to the question before the House and avoid personalities. A member, in referring to another member, should avoid using the member's name. And it is not the person, but the measure that is the subject of a debate. And it is not allowable to arraign the motives of a member, but the nature or consequences of a measure may be condemned in strong terms. As we continue the debate in the coming days and weeks, I thought it might be helpful to remember the requirements of our own rules, the rules which we have on a unanimous basis adopted as the rules for doing business here in the Senate. Senator Leno, for what purpose do you rise, sir? Uh, I would like to make the request which you have just attributed to me, but before I do so, uh, I overlooked in my close of the previous bill that, in fact, uh, Governor Brown is the first governor in anyone's memory to provide greater transparency by placing all of his trailer bill language online for the world to see. And I wanted to share that website address so anyone who is interested in following the proposal that is before us can do so. And that would be at DOF, as in the Department of Finance, dof.ca.gov slash budgeting slash trailer bill language slash documents. So again, anyone interested can go online, read the governor's trailer bill proposals that we will be discussing over the next six, seven weeks. And then just to reiterate that I do, in fact, request unanimous consent to apply the previous roll call vote to Senate Bills 1005 through 1043, which is items 18 through 56. Is there any objection? Seeing and hearing none, Mr. Secretary, if you will please read the remaining bills. At that time, I will substitute the previous roll call. Senate Bill 1005, 1006, 1007, 1008, 1009, 1010, 1011, 1012, 1013, 1014, 1015, 1016, 1017, 1018, 1019, 1020, 1021, 1022, 1023, 1024, 1025, 1026, 1027, 1028, 1029, 1030, 1031, 1032, 1033, 1034, 1035, 1036, 1037, 1038, 1039, 1040, 1041, 1042, in 1043. Members, is there any objection to substituting the previous roll call? If not, those measures, ayes 23, noes 10, the bills are passed. Members, that takes us to our governor's appointment, Senator Steinberg, if you'd like to take those up today. Going to hold those over until a subsequent session. That takes us to our special consent calendar, but before we go to special consent, I want to return to motions and resolutions. Senator Wolk, for what purpose do you rise, Senator? Purposes of introduction, Mr. Please President. Please proceed. I'd like to introduce something, well, some, I'd like to do something that we can all agree on. I'd like to ask you to welcome the fifth grade class from St. James Catholic School in Davis. The Falcons are here to see the Capitol today. We're delighted to welcome your guests to the chamber. Thank you. Senator Hancock, for what purpose do you rise? Purposes of announcement, uh, subcommittee number five on the budget will meet immediately upon adjournment of session in room 113. 
Thank you for that announcement. And Senator Liu, for what purpose do you rise? Uh, purpose of announcement, uh, Budget Subcommittee Number 1 will meet immediately after session in Room 3191. Thank you. Senator Anderson, for what purpose do you rise? Adjourn in memory. Member Senator Anderson has an adjourn in memory. Senator Anderson, if you would proceed, please. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, I am requesting that we adjourn today, um, and we do so in memory of Ronald K. Fuller, who passed away March 10th. Ron, in addition to being a neighbor of mine in Alpine, had a long, distinguished career serving the public. He was the executive assistant to the San Diego County Board of Supervisors and served in the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administration in Washington, D.C. He also rose to the position of Vice President of Government Affairs at, San Diego, at uh, sdg and &E. Ron was active locally and served disti with distinction at the Alpine Fire Protection Board. He was an avid outdoorsman who, who loved the desert, the ocean, and mountains. Ron Fuller is missed by his friends, his colleagues, and as well as his family. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Emerson, for what purpose do you rise, sir? Uh, for purpose of announcement, Please. I'd like to announce that uh, one of our colleagues has a birthday today, my good colleague, Senator Anthony Canella. Senator Canella, we congratulate you. He's, he, he, turned, uh, he turned 21 today. All right. Thank you. Senator Correa. Mr. For purposes of introduction, please help me welcome the up in the balcony students from Fullerton College in Fullerton, California. All right. We're very pleased to welcome that, Mr. <laughs> Senator Negrete McLeod. For purposes of announcement, Thank last you. week I announced budget sub four would have was to meet 15 minutes right after uh, session, and then we continued to speak, so this time we are going to meet after this meeting adjourns. All right. Senator Negrete McLeod announces the committee meeting immediately upon recess of the session. Senator Rubio, for what purpose do you rise, sir? Adjourn in memory of. Please proceed, sir. Uh, members, Mr. President, it is with a heavy heart that I rise to adjourn in the memory of longtime Fresno State Professor Dr. Rodney Anderson, who died earlier this month at the very young age of 46 years old. Dr. Anderson grew up in Nebraska where he was an active uh, member of the Future Farmers of America and a speech team. Since 1996, he taught American politics, statistics, political behavior, and comparative politics to over 200 students each semester, and more importantly, serving as a mentor to students involved in the McNair Post-Baccalaureate Achievement Program. Dr. Anderson was a huge fan of football and baseball and he cheered on bravely for the Fresno State Bulldogs every chance he got. Rodney will be remembered as a caring and compassionate educator and friend. He was clearly committed to the well-being of his family, friends, and the success of students at Fresno State. My thoughts and prayers are with the loved ones of Dr. Anderson, as well as the entire Fresno State community. Thank you, Senator Rubio, and please convey the condolences of the Senate. Senator Saulnier, for what purpose do you rise, sir? Purposes of announcement. Please proceed. Uh, that budget sub three, health and human services, will meet in 4203 upon adjournment. Thank you, Senator. Senator Emerson, for what purpose? Uh, purpose of announcement. I, I f forgot to mention that uh, the twin brother of Senator Canella is having a birthday today, uh, Alex Padilla. Thank, thank, thank you, Senator. Sure, I'm sure, sure we all agree the resemblance is remarkable. Are there any other items under motions and resolutions? If not, members, then we will return to the consent calendar. Let me ask the secretary to please read. Assembly Joint Resolution 31 by Assemblymember Perea relative to the 144th Fighter Wing. Call the roll. Alquist. Aye. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Aye. Berryhill. Blakesley. Aye. Aye. Calderon. Canella, I. Corbett, Correa, De Leon, Desaigne, I. Dutton, Emerson, I. Evans, I. Fuller, I. Gaines, I. Hancock, I. Harmon, I. Hernandez, Huff, I. Kehoe, Lamalfa, I. Leno, 
I, Ted Lou. I, Carol Lou. I, Lowenthal. I, Negretta McLeod. I, Padilla. I, Pavley. Price. I, Rubio. I, Runner. Semidian. I, Steinberg. I, Strickland. Vargas. Walters. Wolk. Wright. I, Wyland. Ye. Ye, I. Call the absent members. Barry Hill. Calderon. Corbett. Correa. De Leon. Dutton. Hernandez. Kehoe. Pavley. Runner. Strickland. Vargas. Walters. Wolk. Wyland. Eyes 25, nose 0. The consent calendar is approved. Senator Steinberg, unless there is other business, I believe the desk is clear. Two o'clock. Members, uh, thank you. The Senate will reconvene at 2 o'clock on Monday. Wish everyone a good weekend. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the Senate will be in recess until 3.30, at which time the adjournment motion will be made. As you've just heard, we will reconvene on Monday at 2 p.m. Without objection, we are in recess.